Hi, everyone. Welcome to this SUSECON digital presentation. This one is called Cont uh, Container and Application Platforms. Kubernetes is not enough. Uh, we're going to go into a little bit uh, of a discussion on what Kubernetes is for application delivery, what platform as a service is, if you use one or both. Uh, I'm Troy Topnik. I'm the product manager for SUSE Cloud Application Platform. And I'm Jeff Hobbs. I'm the director of engineering for SUSE Cloud Application Platform. So one of the things that uh, Jeff and I both hear a lot when we're talking to customers, to customer prospects, and to developers in the field um, is, and especially when we're talking to analysts, is what makes Kubernetes hard for application developers? What is it uh, that is driving all of this action in the ecosystem to create platforms on top of Kubernetes? And why can't developers just go ahead and use the Kubernetes API directly? We'll talk a little bit about that. And one of the reasons is complexity. Uh, this is uh, a bit of an eye chart. Uh, with great power comes great complexity, as my, my son said as, uh, when he saw this diagram. Um, even, if, even with this level of complexity, and this is a screenshot of the CNCF uh, landscape, these are all of the auxiliary and related technologies that are part of the Kubernetes community and part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. What if we stripped out everything except that which is uh, related directly to application development? that's still pretty complex. We see a lot of very useful technologies in here, but they're, it's still a bit of an eye chart. We're still spoiled for choice. Um, uh, all of these projects are developed by different parts of the community to satisfy the needs of application developers. But the application developers or their teams or their management are still going to be responsible for choosing from this array of technologies to produce the best uh, workflow to actually deliver applications. Uh, so if Kubernetes on its own is not enough and it's grown this ecosystem uh, to provide this abundance of options, um, uh, what next? Well, I'd propose that maybe we could have titled this presentation, Kubernetes is too much. Because along with the complexity in the community, there is the complexity that is uh, reflected in the underlying platform, which was, uh, we could argue, developed to replace infrastructure as a service rather than application delivery. So how is platform as a service different from this? Uh, what is PaaS? Uh, and why do we stop talking about this part of our industry once Kubernetes came out, when we started talking about uh, application hosting in a completely different way? Well, let's go back a little ways and uh, consult one of the gurus in this field. Uh, now, Kelsey Hightower is probably the most influential developer advocate in our industry. Uh, he works for Google Cloud Platform. And it's important to note here that uh, Google created Kubernetes based on their experience with Borg. And uh, that is likely what was powering Google App Engine, which was their platform as a service offering, you know, long before uh, many of the other uh, technologies that we now see in the field. Um, so we can assume, given that he is dealing with uh, Google Cloud Platform all the time, that he knows what he's talking about here. Google App Engine was one of the first PaaS offerings alongside uh, uh, things like Heroku and Engine Yard. So we can assume that uh, this is a true statement. Kubernetes is a platform for building platforms. It's a better place to start, not the end game. So this is not the complete picture. Uh, to which uh, somebody very helpfully asked, but uh, honest question, do we really want to encourage every single dev team on earth to build their own platform? And we've seen this happen. So many great startups have failed because they focused on building an amazing platform instead of just shipping code. Uh, that's also a true statement. And I'm very glad to see that, that so I was very glad to see that Kelsey responded, not when an existing platform suits their needs. Uh, he's responding that DIY, do it yourself, is not the most efficient path for making Kubernetes into a viable platform. We'll revisit this a little bit later. But uh, if there's a platform software that suits the needs of your dev team, don't, make, don't waste time making a new one from scratch. So what we're going to need to talk about here is what is that application platform part? What is that part in between Kubernetes and 
actually delivering business value with your applications? What is all the stuff you have to do to get Kubernetes to actually work? And uh, to kick off that part of the discussion, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff. Thanks, Trey. So uh, first off, uh, many of you might have seen this particular diagram called, you know, it's been referred to as the pizza diagram before, where we're separating uh, the different uh, as a service options into their areas and, and what is <clears throat> managed by what layer. So we have infrastructure as a service in, in this case, which we'll be referring to Kubernetes. Uh, some people try to separate infrastructure and container as a service. They're much the same VMs or containers. Then we have platform as a service and, and finally software as a service where the, uh, the bluer color here is a vendor managed section of the stack and the green is then the self-managed. And in this rather simplistic view, you see that the difference between the infrastructure as a service and a platform is that the OS middleware and runtime are now actually uh, managed by the vendor. And, uh, or, you know, that whatever the open uh, source software you might be using in that sense a PaaS should handle the OS middleware and runtime. So if I'm going to extrapolate from this, then um, I might take this little picture out. Uh, here's the perception, you know, going uh, again back a step. There's the virtualization and, and up area, which I'm looking at here, is now in this perception. I have an application and it's in a container. Um, and a lot of people uh, ship variations of this and you know it's the you've got your container you've got your OS specific pieces on it the middleware runtime and of course there's some application but how does this really mass uh, match what the reality is so you know that reality is applications are not containers um, a much better view might be this one where you have an application as a concept uh, comprised of multiple microservices, and then there, each of those microservices does something uh, individual and has its own data, might have different even runtime or middleware. And in this particular case, though, this is a simplistic view even of that reality. When you want to really get into it, there's... Uh, the fact that all these microservices, one might be Java, one might be Python, um, another is in Go, and the data is not even necessarily local at all. You might have some of them talking to an external database, some of them talking to message queues, and they might be sharing. In some other cases, these containers might not even be in the same region. So the the concept that uh, all of this this fits in the pizza box of the difference between containerized management and application management is just the OS middleware and runtime is is definitely a, a huge fallacy that that um, misunderstands the complexity of what it means to manage applications so um, you know what next step in in application management is uh, considering all the other aspects of what it is to be an application so how do I build that application and in what way is it constructed? And there's constructing it once and then there's constructing it a thousand times. And uh, eventually you want to have extra tools in that help you as you do this again and again. How do you connect it to services? So I've talked about that uh, data. Sometimes it's local, sometimes it's external. Um, and, and definitely sometimes you want to be even swapping out the databases. So how do you make that simplistic in in your application life cycle and we're not just talking day zero day one but day n which is, might be a thousand itself and then of course they're scaling it uh is scaling it is it just ramping up a single uh application instance or do you need a hundred or is it dependent on the service how you scale it then there's the routing and and of course on top of all that there's managing the life cycle of the app which is uh versioning uh, the scaling up and down through its life cycle, you know, we've experienced customers who are like, hey, it's coming up to Black Friday, uh, which is a 
huge shopping day in North America. When am I, uh, how, how do I manage this kind of scale and, you know, being able to, to know ahead of time which applications are going to get the greatest load. So, you know, a platform really should understand the world from the application point of view. And if that's the case, um, let's talk about Cloud Foundry as that platform in particular and use that as, as uh, an example of what you can get from a good platform as a service. So what is Cloud Foundry as a platform? Cloud Foundry is an open source project um, and been around for, for, for many years. Uh, but at its high level, it's an API-driven, resilient, and scalable application-aware system. It was uh, originally uh, pre you know, Docker era written for uh, virtual machine based systems and has been brought over to be perfectly functional now in the container management uh, systems and run on Kubernetes. Uh, as a platform, it provides a separation of concerns between the application, the middleware and um, the OS. The, it also handles all the routing and dynamic route management, which are necessary for for uh, scaling and for handling uh, zero downtime upgrades and, and those kind of features. There's also a role-based access control with organization and space concepts. And I'll go into this a, a little later about why that's important. Um, all along with this, you have the service broken, which I mentioned before, and centralized logging and, and other centralization of that application management so that you can really understand everything that you're running in your system, not just as an opaque set of compute resources, but as in this application's running here, this application's running there, and it connects to these services and um, in a self-healing manner and also uh, aware manner so you know when there's something's gone wrong, where to drill in. So let's uh, take a uh, step in and talk a little bit about the separation of concerns and, and, and why this is important. So many of you are probably uh, aware of the, the full stack engineer uh, concept and you know, no disrespect to the, the many talents that the full stack engineers have out there, but as the saying goes, they're a jack of all trades and a, and a master of none. The problem here is, you know, if you're the full stack engineer, you're responsible for everything from the OS image on up to the application code. So, you know, if you're trying to figure out what um, is the when you're responsible for all of those pieces and you're trying to do an update into various parts of the system, your mind is often distracted across all the various pieces that you're working with. So while this jack of all trades can be important for cobbling together early prototypes, this is not what you want to release into production. Because it's the, some, it's the same person who is an excellent Java programmer for addressing your, your application, high-level application needs, is he going to be as aware of the security and performance considerations that are necessary for you to take this into critical production scenarios? So how do we meaningfully address this? Um, and that's where we talk about this separation of concerns. So why rely on the developer for all elements of the stack? You know, what if we could identify the separate pieces? Then we could allow the developer to focus on their strengths, application development. In Cloud Foundry, you have three separate pieces that are identified and make up a container instance. Um, there is the app code on top, uh, the runtime, and finally the OS image. So the developer has full control over the app code, when to push and update, how to scale, etc. But we have to figure out how to separate the other parts and maintain a safe, simple, and, secu and the secure contracts to know that the updates will work and system maintenance is, is easy across the board. So what do you do when one element uh, needs updating? Well, you know, let's take the example of a single library needing an update, the, you know, a shell shock type CVE happens. You know, perhaps it's a simple bug or it's, a, it's that more concerning uh, library with a CVE exploit. So what happens? First, you hope you know you have the right in in the. So what happens in the jack of all trades case first? Uh, 
you you hope that you have all the right notifications in place first off to know that you're going to be aware of the issue at the right time particularly for sensitive zero days but you know so maybe your security team start and uh but do they even know which part of the code might be at fault in which to update so uh, assuming you can track this all down, you have to track back to the responsible developer and rebuild those containers. And, and again, even if you've got the right CI running on this, all the identification points are uh, still not necessarily automatically identified there without a platform to assist you. So, you know, and hopefully your system supports some kind of zero downtime update like Cloud Foundry does. So what about that better way? So in Cloud Foundry, we, we tried to achieve a clean separation. Um, and that means a, that different responsible bar parties can be responsible for the different life cycles of each area without having to involve the others. So again, looking at the app code, the runtime, and the OS image as different parts. Um, the runtime in Cloud Foundry is defined by build packs. So build packs were initially developed by Heroku, then brought over to Cloud Foundry. And, and finally, they've actually have a life of their own in the uh, container space and, um, and are, are good for the general runtime definition and management of, of, of runtimes. So what do build packs provide? Um, they have a uh, they provide a balance of control that reduces that operational burden on developers and and supports those enterprise operators who need to manage apps at scale. They basically ensure that apps meet security and compliance requirements without the developer intervention. And they essentially so the build pack again is that runtime definition point that they become the glue between the OS level and the application dependencies that can be independently managed, allowing for efficient handling of those day two app operations that are often difficult to manage with other container mechanisms. So, you know, they rely on compatibility guarantees to safely apply patches without having to rebuild artifacts or without intentionally, unintentionally changing application behavior. Um, and in addition, uh, Cloud Foundry defines that base OS image as stacks. So you can have variable stacks in the system. And of course, then you can be updating those stacks independently. So between the application code, the runtime, and the OS image, it is possible to independently manage and uh, update those in a day two sense without breaking the applic end application operation. So that's the separation of concerns. Uh, let's look at another aspect of the Cloud Foundry platform, and that's routing. So uh, routing is basically a, a limited service mesh capabilities, but in, when I say limited, it's their application focused. And uh, it's a software Go-based virtual routing layer with a lot of enhanced features. This can be waiting, um, the control over how the, the scheduling works or also routing to other services. So you can interject something like application SSO with a simple uh, switch for, for your applications, not having to build it into each application that you're running. And of course, it does that, uh, the basic load balancing across all application instances. Moving on from that, uh, another aspect of the uh, Cloud Foundry platform is role-based access control. And, you know, there are role-based access controls in, in many different systems, but the one, the organization and space model that comes in Cloud Foundry is actually a very nice system in order to uh, define ownership and management of an application. So in Cloud Foundry, no single user owns an app, an org does and the space is where it runs. So this collaborative by nature design is extremely well suited for enterprise environments. You know, without the unnecessary complexity, meaning smaller groups can easily manage it as well. Uh, you also have this multi-tenant aware um, and fine-grained quota management. So the quotas can be placed on particular spaces at the org level and or both. Overall, um, this leads to the ability to basically scaly ma scalably manage applications. Um, again, uh, the entire system is API driven. So this is a bit of a, a UI view um, uh, of the, the open source UI component of Cloud Foundry. But 
everything you see here is driven from uh, APIs that can be done at the command line, uh, the UI as you see here, or uh, driv uh, integrated into your CI. And so the difference is uh, it's not an opaque set of workloads. It's like this VM running over here, this container over here, and I've got 10 containers, which ones are running my services and which ones are running my apps. I can see that in, in a much more uh, uh, overview friendly manner when I have a platform that understands things as, as an application. So a good application platform will provide the tools that empower developers on that larger scale in the enterprise environment. What you're getting out of it is, is freedom to choose, whether that's the, the language choice or the, the services choice, uh, providing you an ability to innovate quickly because you're not necessarily restricted by certain choices because they don't fit a particular model. Here we've defined the model and uh, adapted for the flexibility within it. And from that, you can manage applications at scale while adhering to enterprise standards. So you move from you know, a very disjoint production uh, uh, to, to implementation scenario into a nice smooth one. So that is the Cloud Foundry uh, platform. And with that, I uh, pass it back to Troy. So what does this Cloud Foundry platform have to do with SUSE and what does it have to do with Kubernetes? Um, well, let's take it back to uh, Kelsey Hightower. Uh, I saw this tweet a few days ago, and uh, as he said, it's, it's still true. He's still having these conversations. I'm convinced the majority of people managing infrastructure just want a PaaS. The only requirement, it has to be built by them. And I don't think this is an endorsement of do-it-yourself. I don't think, because uh, back in, 19, in 2017, he said, November 2017, he said, uh, not when an existing platform suits their needs. So nobody needs to reinvent the wheel, uh, but wheels can always be improved. And uh, at SUSE, we've spent some time improving the wheel. Um, we have a platform that we built for you and for the open source community. It's called SUSE Cloud Application Platform. And we've been working hard over the years to make Cloud Foundry uh, leaner and more modern. And we worked to bring the most successful components from the CNCF uh, ecosystem that we saw on that very complex slide uh, back into this project uh, to make it uh, uh, solve problems for not only the uh, platform developers, but also the platform operators, those that have to actually manage a Cloud Foundry PaaS, manage the platform for their users, we know that managing workloads is something that Kubernetes does very well. So we've adopted a new architecture. We pioneered this architecture. And uh, with the next revision of uh, Cloud Application Platform, we're going to take it a step further with some projects that SUSE has been heavily involved in upstream. Uh, the most visible of these, as you've seen on some of the previous slides, uh, is a web interface called Stratos. Uh, when Jeff and I started working with Cloud Foundry, it did not have uh, an open source web UI. Uh, and SUSE has built one and contributed it to the community. Uh, it's not only a very good Cloud Foundry uh, UI, it is an excellent uh, Kubernetes and Helm UI. Uh, we made it with a multi-API, multi-endpoint uh, proxy design intentionally so that it can be extensible and can serve the needs of the platform as the platform evolves. Uh, featured here also is KubeCF, which is a, the evolution of SUSE Cloud Foundry and also donated upstream to the Cloud Foundry Foundation. KubeCF is a containerized distribution of Cloud Foundry application runtime, which forms the basis of SUSE's Cloud Application Platform. It's uh, deployed with Helm, which is a commonly understood and well-supported tool in the Kubernetes community and one that we support as well in Stratos. Um, another project where we've uh, done most of the heavy lifting is uh, Quark's. Quark's uh, operator it provides uh, CRDs, custom resource definitions for Kubernetes for supporting complex uh, workloads in Kubernetes. And these uh, CRDs came from the uh, Bosch orchestration layer that uh, used to be a requirement for setting up Cloud Foundry. If you wanted to set up Cloud Foundry on VMs, you would have to use Bosch, which was a specific orchestrator, 
for VMs for Cloud Foundry. We made it possible for that entire community of uh, users and of software distributions, because there's more than just Cloud Foundry application runtime, to be ported over to Kubernetes in a very uh, Kubernetes native and Kubernetes idiomatic way. And last but not least, Irene comes into the picture. Irene is a, an interface to Cloud Foundry that allows for the running of applications directly in the Kubernetes scheduler so that the applications that Jeff was talking about that this whole system is centered around are actually running as pods in Kubernetes and are treated as first class citizens. To this, uh, we've attached, as uh, Jeff mentioned, we have services to keep state for these applications, a variety of services. They can be uh, run on Kubernetes as well, optionally. And we have a broker that does that, a broker which uh, deploys Helm charts to Kubernetes to provide service instances for those applications. And the whole thing uh, can run on any Kubernetes, and we support by default. So this is a, a CAS platform, Amazon EKS, Azure AKS, and Google GKE. So this is all in aid of doing some very important things for your business. Uh, we've borrowed some numbers here from Cloud Foundry Foundation research. They found that the average cost savings per application development cycle was $100,000 for the large enterprises that use, uh, use Cloud Foundry. Uh, that those same enterprises found that uh, they had a 10-week faster time to market per application on average. Some had even uh, uh, more significant gains. And of course, uh, the fact that we've ported this to Kubernetes and SUSE has led that work. Uh, allows for maximum flexibility of its of its deployment target. So, uh, as I mentioned before, Amazon EKS, Azure AKS, and Google GKE, or anywhere that Kubernetes can run. Um, the uh, this is all in aid of uh, allowing our customers to simplify their development workflow, governance of their software estate, modernize their application hosting infrastructure, and accelerate innovation through continuous delivery of line of business applications. So if you want to know more, just go to the SUSE website. Uh, you'll find a link there to the cloud application platform page, which gives you all the details of where you can find out more. You can jump directly to the documentation at documentation.suse.com and see how it's set up and see how it's used. If you wanted to look behind the scenes at the kind of work that we've done to make all of this uh, happen, feel free to take a look in GitHub. In the Cloud Foundry Incubator and the Cloud Foundry main uh, organization, you will see a KubeCF, Stratos, Quark's operator, and Irene. And you'll see our contributions there, and you'll be able to kick the tires. Um, and as always, we really welcome feedback uh, on our products and on, on the work that we're doing. And we like to talk to customers. We like to talk to people who are just interested in the software. And there's a vibrant community going on at uh, the Cloud Foundry Slack, slack.cloudfoundry.org. You'll find uh, most of us in the Stratos, uh, Cube CF Dev, and Quarks Dev channels if you want to get, uh, get in touch with us. So thank you very much for attending this SUSECON digital presentation. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you learned something useful. And thanks very much for your time today. Thank you.